over to you and I'll just mute myself for this. Thanks, Katie. So as Katie said, I'm um, Eileen Conlon, a member of the um, business school or business and creative industries school. Um, and here today with me is also Jim Johnson and Ron Livingston. Um, and we all work on KTPs within the, the business school. Um, Jim and I have had a bit of a, a longer relationship because years ago I was actually a KTP associate as well. So um, I've worked on KTPs from the actual associate perspective and Jim was my mentor throughout that project as well. Um, so we've been working on KTPs for quite a while and during my time at the UWS, I've been involved in another six KTPs. Um, they're all very, very different in nature. So we'll tell you a bit about them today. Um, so first things first, you're probably wondering what is an MKTP and what is a KTP? So traditionally we had what we called knowledge transfer projects. And it was where a team of academics got together um, with a, an associate, placed the associate in a, a company and worked on delivering a project for that company that was innovative in nature. And usually the, the knowledge transfer projects had a sort of scientific orientation to them as well, and they had to be innovative in nature. Um, however, it was identified that actually there's quite a lot of business and management um, skill sets that companies need, and that there's the opportunities for actually having management knowledge transfer projects. Um, and so funding became available for management specific knowledge transfer projects. Jim and I worked on an application and got one of the, the first um, management knowledge transfer projects um, granted or awarded um, in the UK, which we're, we're still working on just now. It's our project called Inspiring Projects in Glass. Um, but we're well versed in the, the sort of funding process and what we have to do to make sure to obtain the, the grant that we're doing something innovative. So it's funding from the government, um, either be Innovate UK or BAS. Um, the funding tends to range on an average between 150,000 and a quarter of a million. That's to cover um, all the expenses of employing an associate and such like, and any additional funding in terms of equipment and things like this that the, the, um, you need to deliver the project. Um, and the projects vary in time length as well. So an average project would maybe be 24 months, but we have got projects that are running for 27 and 30 months as well. And that obviously influences the grant that you, you can um, obtain as well. But as we've said, the main thing is that whatever the project is, it has to be quite innovative. Um, and in some instances, it might not, the, the knowledge that you're transferring into the company might not be innovative to you, but it's something new and fresh to the actual company that you're working within or, or helping um, deliver the project in as well. But there's quite a robust application process. So you are obtaining this grant. Um, it's quite a large grant, and so you need to invest time and effort into developing that, that application in the first instance. Um, and the first thing you've got to do is identify a, a company of interest, a company that is interested in embarking on the, the knowledge transfer project journey with you. Um, and that company has got to meet certain criteria as well. So you'll work with the KTP Centre headed um, by, by Stuart Mackay and his team um, in identifying companies of interest. It may be somebody that they were already working with, or it might even be somebody within your company that you know within your own network that has got potential for a knowledge transfer project. Um, and the sort of first steps are identifying the company, identifying that it's feasible for them to do a, a knowledge transfer project so they're financially stable and such like. As I say, Stuart Mackay works quite a bit in that area. And then identifying what the company's needs are and how you could support that through a, a knowledge transfer project. When you've identified what the company's needs are, you then have to look for a wider team to deliver the project as well. So what skill set do you need? What mentoring do you need for an associate to be able to deliver the actual project um, throughout the two years? And you pull that team together and collectively as a team, you work on developing what we call the work plan. And the work plan is literally looking at every week across through the duration of the project and identifying what tasks need to be um, delivered throughout that. So for instance, um, one of the ones we're working on just now, advanced clothing solutions, very much the, the first three months of that project was gathering a lot of market intelligence data, carrying out some consumer research to get the thoughts and feelings of customers in terms of circular economy. So the work plan's very much tailored to what the project is actually going to deliver. 
Now, in terms of the work plan, it's to be really detailed and it's to show impact and innovation and deliverables for the company. Um, and Stuart's team, Stuart Mackay's team, is very good in giving advice on how to tweak this, how to edit it. Um, you can even ask them for samples and they'll show you samples of previous work plans as well. Um, and again, they've got a good, um, it's good to take their advice because they've got a good pass rate for uh, obtaining grants. Um, and also the wider team and the, the BCI school will help give you input as well if you need support in those areas as well. Alongside the work plan in order to obtain the grant, there's also an online form, which is mainly completed by Stuart Mackay and his team, but the academics submit some CV information and some impact benefit information onto that online form as well. Once you've completed all the, the paperwork, you then um, have set dates throughout the year where you can submit for uh, a KTP a grant, grant or award. And then you've just got to wait to see whether you're approved or whether you're rejected. Um, and the, the awarding body will give you feedback on what was good about your application and what could be strengthened about your application as well. So you do get advice in terms of um, how well your application has been written as well, which you can take forward for writing further applications. As I say, the grants are quite um, large sums of money and so you've really got to show how you've been innovative and what the impact and the benefits on the company um, is going to be and also where you can get your research insights from as well so how the knowledge transfer project is going to contribute to the body of knowledge as well so it's trying to capture both of those sort of perspectives in the one application forum Once you've um, submitted all your paperwork and the, the grant has been accepted, you have to go through a recruitment process as well, and you need to recruit an associate that you can place within the company to deliver the project. Um, now, we do get advised to wait until we've heard about the grant before we start this process. However, it is a lot of paperwork, so sometimes while you're waiting in the grant approval, it's good to start writing the recruitment information um, that you need in order to advertise for the job as well. And a couple of the documents that you have to write is the job specification. So you need to go back to your work plan and really look at what skill set do you need the associate to have, but also um, what mentoring skills that you can pass on and where you can train the associates as well. Sorry, I see Katie's got her hand up. Yeah, sorry, are you, are, did you switch slides there? Because uh, uh, it's not switched. Oh, right. I have, I've been switching them, but I've just noticed they're not going. Wait till we see. So this was the application process, identifying the interested company, identifying what the needs are. So that's like a pre-visit and a, a discussion with the company and Stuart Mackay, looking for the right academic team to support the application, spending a lot of time developing that very detailed work plan, completing the online form in conjunction with Stuart Mackay's team and then awaiting for your um, approval and feedback, which then moves you on to the recruitment stage. So you've got to write a very detailed job specification um, and you will have support from the human resources team. So our support is usually Susan Gormley um, and Christine Murray and Marie at, at HR or at POD give us support with the, the job specification, but really it's down to us as academics to detail the information on that job specification and really highlight what skill set we require from an associate. And what you've got to remember as an associate is a new graduate or a graduate that's um, only graduated within five years, that's the sort of criteria. And therefore you won't have everything that you need within the associate, but you need to be able to upskill them um, in particular areas as well. So you need to identify what's most important and then what would be like um, skills that they would, you would like them to have um, and then identify the other areas where you know you can offer a lot of support in those areas as well. So then you write the job advert as well and you're also responsible for, um, HR will promote the job advert but they ask you to try and promote it throughout your channels like LinkedIn and things like this as well. They'll even ask you if you know previous students that you've taught that might be interested in the job and to, to send it out to your own networks. And then you get involved in the shortlisting process for applicants as well. So what I would say is it's good to look out for the pod training sessions in terms of recruitment, advertising um, and shortlisting as well. I actually went on a, a mini college course that um, Human Resources sent us on 
um, and it was just to um, upskill in this particular area um, so, as you're, um, so, so as you're fully equipped to be able to go through this process and get the right applicant um, or the right person for the job at the end. So you go through the shortlist and applicants, you arrange the interviews and you carry out the interviews in conjunction with the academic team and the company. Um, you also have to approach the business school and fill out what they call a SAR form, and that's to get permission to recruit an associate. Um, and all that paperwork has to go back to um, POD. And then you need to agree an actual starting date and the, the actual agreed salary as well. So you go through the whole recruitment process before you actually get to the stage where you're involved in delivering the, the KTP project. So there is a lot of sort of paperwork pre-KTP that you need to be aware of um, in terms of obtaining the, the grant in the first place. However, once you start the project, you've got access to a company which gives you some great research opportunities um, that you can um, capitalize on. So you've got that access to live industry data. Um, in areas where the company needs research, you can be carrying out that research and using that information for further publications and such like. So for instance, I was speaking about advanced clothing solution. That's one of our KTPs that's involved in the circular economy, um, obviously in the area of fashion and clothing and they, they do rental wear. Um, and that has given us access to a lot of information that we're currently using to write a book chapter. Um, on the circular economy, um, highly relevant just now. Um, we, we fed into COP26 and things like this with the information that we had from the company as well, but it's given us an opportunity to gather information that enhances our research. Um, but it depends on your project where the opportunities will, will arise. And part of a KTP is that you will get papers published and that you will go to conference and speak about the work that you're doing. So a couple of the other opportunities that I've personally had is working with Albion Environmental. Um, they are a waste management company, but also a training facility. Um, and to set some of their marketing objectives along the area of customer service, we had to develop a measurement tool for them to manage their customer service. So this was really interesting for me and for my personal research because this is the area that my PhD is in. Um, and whilst I was developing a bespoke measurement tool for the promotional merchandise industry, we realised that actually Albion Environmental could do with a similar tool, but very bespoke and specific to their business needs. Um, and so we took time out as a, an academic team to consider what we could do in terms of developing this bespoke tool. And obviously it's contributing to the service quality literature that's um, already in, um, available to us. And we've developed this tool that capitalizes on um, both the service quality literature around education um, and sort of university education and things like this as well, but also around waste management. And it's sort of merging the, the aspects of both together to develop this measurement tool. We've implemented that within the business um, and we've got some good stats now that we can use to help set our future marketing objectives. Um, but for us as an academic team, we're now looking to target conference, um, conferences in January um, and then further develop that into journal articles as well. Um, another area that we've managed to gather insight and data from that we're developing into um, journals and, and hopefully we'll get them accepted you know that that's just the, getting the information is just the first part of the process it's, it's what you do with it after that's important and um, we've also been using a model which is Ke Keegan's international market selection model but across a few of our KTPs advanced clothing solution and then also um, another one with Modo um, they're involved in international market selection so choosing the right countries to enter into and what we've found is that whilst we've got this Keegan's model actually there's some adaptions that have had to be made for specific companies. And so we're taking theoretical academic models, adapting them for life scenarios in industry, and then we're getting the information and data that we need to write up papers on how we've utilised theory, but had to adapt it for specific situations in industry as well. So Jim and I have been doing a lot of work in these, these areas um, on our KTPs, um, and I, I know that um, Ron's going to tell you a bit more about KTPs he's been working on and the opportunities that he's had in terms of research. What I would say is that the sort of challenge is that you have all these opportunities to gather insights and gather the information for the research, but it goes back to 
getting the time to actually pull it together and write it up. And so you've got to be quite focused and set yourself deadlines so as you can make best use of the, the data that you've gathered um, and the information that you have. So KTPs in general are a really good way to access information to give you opportunities to collect data and get more journal articles, book articles, conference papers written in your specific field. Um, and I would say one of the challenges is actually finding the company that needs a KTP in your specific area so as it helps you enhance your research in your specific area as well. I've been quite fortunate that um, the KTPs that I've had have all, all looked for marketing strategy and other areas within marketing that I'm studying. Um, and the, the Albion environmental one was unanticipated and it actually just came up. I was like, you know, this is similar to my PhD and we could be doing the same as an academic team for, for Albion and really delivering something that's useful for the company um, in terms of a, a measurement tool, but also useful for, for developing our um, research careers as well. So thanks for, for listening um, to the presentation and I'll hand you over to Ron now, but if you've got any questions, we'll have a, a good chat after Ron's presentation as well. Excellent, Eileen, if you can yeah, share. stop sharing that. Stop share. There we go, thank you. And I will pop my one up. Sure. Um, and you'll have heard Eileen refer to someone called Stuart Mackay. And I see Stuart's on the call. So welcome, Stuart. And when we get to the Q&A session, Stuart is the key person in our university. Um, and uh, in fact, I was reading his newsletter, just as we aside from the KTP Centre, um, uh, just yesterday it came out, the, the kind of festive one, and the achievements of our university, really since Stuart has arrived, although obviously as Jim will tell you, Jim Johnson will say, you have a very successful track record over the years anyway, but we're now number one in the UK for management KTPs and the number one in Scotland uh, and have been for a wee while in terms of the number of KTPs and the value um, uh, you know, the, so I can't emphasize enough how important and useful, and just to echo what Eileen said, the, the, the support that we get from Stuart and his team, but Stuart in particular, is fantastic. You know, it's more than fantastic, in fact. So I would encourage everyone in this call, firstly, to do what Stuart says if you've missed the chat there, update your profile so that uh, have a look at the chat there and Stuart's given you a link to put your expertise. And secondly, to have a chat with the likes of Jim or, or myself or Eileen about KTPs in general, but also Stuart and his team are there to support you know, with, you know, if you've got an idea, you've got a link with an organization or whatever, or just a kernel of a thought about what might be there, speak to people early. Um, and certainly when I was putting this one together, which is the Oak Tree Inn, um, case study, so I'm just going to talk to you very briefly and specifically about this one. Um, Stuart was very much helpful right from the beginning in terms of pre-application, right through to when you have to submit the final report. Um, so make use of the team and the expertise. Another thing I'll mention just uh, before I get into the detail of this one is that the, the school through our Dean has now um, uh, basically put in place that anyone who wants to get involved with a KTP, even if it's not necessarily in your area of expertise, then you can join a team, get 1% uh, uh, in your AP, because there's a 10% allocation for colleagues per KTP. So the team splits that 10% up amongst them. So just to get experience of a KTP project, the Dean is supporting everybody who wants to obviously chat with your line manager. It's important you do that and then get it built into your, your my contributions. But you can join a team just to get the experience and then you become a full team member to contribute, and then eventually you could even be a, a what we call a PI, a principal investigator, the lead person for a, a, a your own KTP project. So please don't think that you need to have you know, a company and work up all the detail yourself. There are people to support you with that, or you can jump on to get experience now uh, with new emerging KTP projects. Okay, so basically we encourage everybody to get involved. Um, they're excellent both in terms of income generation, I should also add, but also that they are counted as research income 
for ref purposes. So for when the next ref cycle comes round and whenever it's going to be 2027 or 28, um, income from now until then, the census date, income from KTPs will be counted towards your ref submission. So it's very important as well for your, your kind of personal profile and career, as well as being just an excellent thing to do for all the reasons that I'm just about to mention. So Oaktrian, um, if you fancy a trip out over the winter period or when the weather's better, then at a place called Balmaha, which is on the banks of Loch Lomond, just on the southeast corner of Loch Lomond, about 40 minutes drive from our Paisley campus, then you will find a place called the Oak Tree Inn that you see in the uh, um, picture here. But it's a growing family business. It's been run, running from over 40 years now. Uh, started off with a, a actually a one-person electrician's business and they expanded. And they now have a range of different businesses um, from um, the, the, what you see here, which is an inn, a restaurant. Uh, they have accommodation now across this building and other buildings for over 90 people. Um, they apply. Uh, they employ well over 100 staff. Um, they have a drive-through coffee uh, place near Glasgow. Um, they have uh, another cafe in Aberfoyle. Um, they've got another seasonal cafe in Luss on the other side of Loch Lomond. So if you're driving up towards Glencoe or Oban, you would pass that. Um, and they're also uh, into some property development. So they've got some properties that they rent out or renovated and, and re um, have re done up longer term. And they've got a share in a bakery in Dumbarton. Um, they used to own another hotel in Blainfield, uh, which is uh, near Milgai, if you know the geography of Glasgow, Northern Gla Glasgow. So they've been diversifying. And the main challenge with the Oak Tree Inn uh, looking at the the KTP because you've got to you've got to have a, a project that is uh, eligible for the KTP criteria, and uh, for a while that meant that you had to look at you know normally some form of kind of innovative product or um, uh, some way of uh, in terms of some form of innovation approach, but now you might have noticed on the front page of Eileen's first PowerPoint slide a small M before the KTP. So there is a big investment now from Innovate UK, which is the big government um, nationwide initiative under which this falls. And they have developed management KTPs and Stuart will correct me, but I think it was about, initially it was about 25 million pounds of a budget and they're, they're, they're very keen on the management KTPs. So it is about how can you um, improve processes, management skills, competencies, uh, strategic areas of focus, uh, looking at supply chain management, all of these different areas that really fit firmly and squarely in a business school. Um, so they're very much encouraging these sort of KTPs now. So the Oak Tree Inn, their challenge, and you've got to, as I say, you've got to be quite clear about the challenge that you're trying to help. The challenge of the Oak Tree Inn, uh, in a nutshell, is it's a family business. Um, they've been very successful uh, up until the start of the KTP. Uh, and continue to be so despite the pandemic. But part of their challenge was that they were very much um, no planning, uh, no systems in place. It was a, a basic a family business that built it up to over three million pounds of turnover. They wanted to get to ten million pounds turnover, but they needed different ways and different processes in terms of managing the business, uh, as well as some technology being brought in in terms of uh, dashboard technology and management information systems so that they could um, make decisions on evidence-based uh, data. So it was really quite a transformation for the business, but establish and Stuart and the team and Jim and others can help you very much refine that focus um, that you need to include within your application form. So two slides from me, hints and tips. Number one, absolutely, you know, if you're wanting to be part of a team, or you've got an idea yourself, or you've, you know, over the Christmas period, you meet up with someone who runs their own business, or maybe is a senior person within a, a company, and you think, oh, we, we could work with you to help you solve your particular issues and help you transform your business in an innovative way, then liaise early and closely with our UWS KTP Centre. Also, what you need to do is, I think in the preamble, Jim, if you were on the call, Jim was saying, you know, no KTP is the same. Everyone is different. So you really need to think about how you can tailor that whole experience 
to the company and to the organization. You need It needs to meet their needs, but you also then need to balance the needs of Innovate UK. And of course, you need to balance the needs and what we can contribute as a university. So it's a kind of triumvirate. But just as one simple example there, Eileen mentioned about recruiting and that whole process. And so therefore, the KTP starts way before you get your app, you frame up your application, you discuss it with the company, you then work on your application, you submit it, you get feedback, you know, hopefully it's approved, but you also get feedback, then you start to recruit your knowledge transfer associate. Um, so just as an example, because it's a family business, we knew that it was very important that the person who was going to be employed full time for three years on this project would need to fit in with the family. So we actually had um, obviously the normal, you, you bring in uh, application forms and we had a first round of interviews that was actually held in the conservatory of the family home. So they got a tour of the business uh, out in the bottom half first and met people. And then they had their formal interview doing a presentation in the conservatory of the family home. And then we narrowed it down and we did a second interview again in the, in the um, family business with the father, Sandy Fraser, and two of the sons who were also there present um, to, to, you know, to do follow-up interviews. So we added in that extra step because the family wanted to make absolutely sure they were getting the right person in, which in, indeed they did. Because the peculiarities of the, 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 the business was the family are there seven days a week, 24 hours a day, which was one of their challenges. But if a KTP associate had to be uh, comfortable enough working in that environment, but the, the KTP associate also had to then, from the family side of things, had to, to over time, be able to work with them. Uh, LMC is the Local Management Committee meetings. So these are held uh, every quarter, every three months. Now, these are very important occasions. So once the KTP is up and running, uh, you have a pre-meeting uh, right before the project even starts. And then you have these every three months. And these are very important. You have someone from a, the kind of Scottish, West of Scotland rather, KTP Centre who attends those. In my case, it was a guy called Jerry Black, who's excellent support. But you need to make sure for these meetings, because this is where basically they report back to the funders to make sure that the public money is being well spent and that you're on target with your objectives. So you need to manage those very carefully with your KTP team, with the company and with the KTP associate um, and prepare for those well in advance. And I always thought, well, it's not just this meeting, but even before we have this meeting, think again ahead to the next meeting six months away so that you have a, well, a good plan. And uh, you know, if you've got a great KTP associate, which we, we did, then they will do a lot of the work to make sure those meetings are well run. So that's the third hints and tip. Uh, also, you need to make sure that the KTP associates work is kept within the remit of the KTP. It can be, you know, especially if you've got an enthusiastic associate, that's a knowledge transfer associate, KTA, that, you know, they might, and, and the company could be quite demanding as well and maybe ask them to get involved in other things. So it's about just managing to ensure that you've always got one eye on the objectives of the KTP, which can flex, you know, obviously the needs of a business when you start, say a three year one can change after one or two years, as indeed it did with ours because COVID kicked in. Um, but just making sure that you're supporting your KT, uh, your knowledge transfer associate um, and, and you're fully there. And of course they've got to, follow the same university processes as we do, because they're an employee of the university, not the company. Um, although they work full time in the company in most cases, they're a university employee, so they still have to do their my contribution forms and get the support of the university. Um, I would suggest that you think early, think well ahead about the final report, almost from the beginning. That's what we did. We thought, right, because well, I want this to be an award-winning one, and get a grade A, um, and also, if you get a grade A rating, which is outstanding, I think, um, is the terminology, then it also is then eligible for a knowledge, a KTP national award. So you can be considered and apply for that. Um, so think early about that final report. So what are you wanting out of your project? What's benefit to the university? What's benefit to the company? And importantly, the knowledge, uh, the KTA as well, your associate. You know, they'll have to have a career after the KTP, might be with the company, might be elsewhere. So how do you support them with that as well? And number six, uh, my second slide, uh, my final slide is also going to look at this. So it's also thinking about what more can you do with your KTP? And Eileen mentioned a bit about this as well, about your research outputs uh, and so on as well. 
But in terms of the additional things, just to give you a flavour, um, well, I wrote a case study that's now published in the 12th edition of what is now, apparently, according to Harvard Business School, it's the most cited strategy textbook or most used strategy textbook now in the world. It used to be Europeans, Europe's leading strategy textbook by, um, it, originally it was by Johnson Scholes, but now he's got other readers there. So that, and in fact, I'm writing, as we speak, I'm writing the, an updated case for the 13th edition that will get published this time next year. So we wrote that case study, but we also invested in what's called a digital case study website to support the case. It brings up bang up to date information. Um, the directors were also involved in a presentation of this. We actually ran a workshop about the case run by Pearsons for the book. Uh, and there was about 85, I think, European academics on that call. And they, we involved the director. So it's about seeing how you can involve the, the company people in more than just the KTP. Um, the company actually funded two master students over a summer, so three month paid internships to work and to look at particular projects. We also had MBA students doing their dissertation projects for the company. So again, they were out interviewing people and coming up with uh, recommendations for them. One, for instance, was in how they could possibly expand into this emerging area of wellness and well-being, holiday um, uh, trips and stays. Um, we had international delegations, China, Russia, and so on, who visited the business to talk specifically about the KTP process. Um, the directors came in and gave guest lecture slots on different uh, lectures and sessions that we did. Uh, we actually put together a series of six workshops for the master students, masters in international management students, uh, last year and we're running again this year. So the students are doing that and hopefully COVID allowing the students will actually this year be able to visit the company and present their recommendations to the directors. Um, and we've had groups pre-COVID, we've had groups of students who've gone out to the business to see you know, how a real life business works. They've maybe read the case and they've then gone out to just to ask questions with the directors. Um, it's also been used by other business schools. We ran one just a couple of months ago with Salford Business School in Manchester. Um, and again, the directors joined their online session. So it's exposing UWS as well. This is the other thing. You know, this is all good promotion for our university about how we're involved and how we're doing things. Um, and of course, as, a, as a, Eileen had mentioned, you can have research papers that come out of this, publications, uh, and we've actually got an application that's just been submitted for another company. It's our second KTP with the university. So these things can lead on downstream to other engagement between a business and the university. So what I encourage you to do is just to think wider than just the actual KTP maximize thing. So that's the end of the two slides I was going to use. I'll pass back now to Katie. You, um, or unless Jim uh, or Eileen or indeed even Stuart want to, to add anything just now. Hi, hi Ron, thanks for that. Uh, Jim Johnston here from the Business School UWS universally known as Jim B. Johnston, because there's two people with the same name in the school, as you may or may not know. But one, one thing to pick up from the chat that I think is important, and I know Stuart's answered it in there, is that the companies do pay cash to the university for the contribution of the university. It varies between 25 to 50,000 pounds per year for the projects, depending on the size of the company and also depending on the salary that's paid to the graduate. So this isn't just a grant scheme, but the companies may, may or may not take it seriously. It's meant to be, as Ron and Irene have both said, to be of major importance to the company and so important they're prepared to pay their own cash for it. And that's an important part of the partnership that needs to be highlighted, I think. Somebody asked a question and that's the short answer to it. But we, we spoke in preparation for this briefly. I think the real value will come from questions and answers. And I don't want to take up any more time talking at the audience because I think the value will be in what comes up. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, so Jim is the, the KTP lead in, in the BSI, uh, BCI, sorry, too many acronyms. Um, so thank you very much, Eileen and Ron. And um, so as as Jim B was saying, um, I think the value is going to be the Q and A session. There's a lot of stuff happening in the chat as well. 
if you're keeping up with that. Um, Stuart has been posting links um, discussing the contribution of funding from organization and um, as Ron was saying, reminding us all to keep our profiles up to date for, as he put it, the beauty pageant part of uh, <coughs> KTP recruitment. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to, uh, we'll, we'll start the Q&A just now, use the chat, use your mic and um, ask our experts. Void check. I figured I might, well, I, might, I might as well start since nobody's saying anything. So my understanding is that the main person who's actually doing, let's say, the um, actual on-site experience slash fieldwork slash collecting data is the KTP associate rather than us. And we are essentially relying on what the associate is bringing back to us as far as publica publications are concerned or our own providing our own advice. Is that the right understanding or do we have, or is there more of a hands-on approach from us? The, the, thanks for that, Wojciech. The ba best way to understand the, the associate's role or the graduate's role is they are finishing their apprenticeship by doing a, the KTP under the direct supervision and guidance of the academics. So in the old days, an engineering apprentice could be six years and the first three or four years were theory and basic stuff. And the final two years are under the close supervision of um, a qualified engineer. And the KTP model is essentially the same as that. So they're not working on their own like they would on a dissertation that we criticise them. They are working to our guidance, instruction over how to do it because we are seen as the experts. So they're the vehicle to transfer the knowledge from us rather than it being the standard dissertation approach. That's just not the KTP at all. Okay, so basically our, let's call it hands-on experience is quite limited once we've recruited the associate. It's more like they, they're the intermediary be between us. Mm. It depends on what's actually happening at the time as well. So sometimes you're okay to leave the associate to deliver part of the project and sometimes you need a lot of your input. And usually when it comes to the area of research, that's when you're putting in a lot of input as well. So for instance, at Advanced Coding Solutions, we were carrying out consumer research and Karina and I spent a lot of time with the associate designing and developing the research. She gathered the information um, in terms of utilising the, the company database and things like this, but we were involved in the design. And similarly with um, Albion Environmental, because that was my sort of background area for customer service, um, and I had the sort of technical um, or theoretical knowledge, if you like, I brought that to the party, and, and Heather sat with me, and um, we, we also um, included the um, director from the company, and um, we then developed together the model that we were going to use for testing for customer service. So the involvement varies depending on the task being delivered at the time. Um, but even at that, you're involved in week to week discussions with the associates. You're always getting information fed back to you about the project as well. So and it does give you good access to client bases and working processes as well. Yeah, and just to add maybe to that, your voice check, your knowledge transfer associate is in it full time um, in terms of that's their their full time job and our role as academics is there to, to you know to give the academic knowledge transfer input into the project and support them but there is this kind of nominal 10 percent if you like uh, in terms of the which is what roughly equates to half a day a week nominally but i would stress what eileen says sometimes you might find that you're doing more than that one week but then at another point or phase in the either the year or the project, it, it's maybe slightly less. But critical to this, and I can't stress this enough from my experience and, and from others. And in fact, I did my first KTP project in the late 90s with a company uh, that was actually in the creative sphere called Curious Orange. That for those of you who are into music will know maybe that, that that's actually the title of a, a song by a band, a punk band called The Fall. Um, so the the director at that time, based in Glasgow, 
was a was a an ex punk, and um, he named his company, which actually went on to do very well as a creative media industry. And you know, from that very, I was I was there as a, a, a um, you're kind of learning the ropes, if that's the the expression in terms of the KTP. The first thing I learned to really emphasise this is the importance of getting the right KT uh, knowledge transfer associate. You, you get a good appointment, you get a good individual who's there supporting it, then the project uh, will fly. So just to emphasize, you're know, taking time to get the right KT associate is very, very important at the beginning. Uh, I think Stuart once said to me about some stats about, um, you know, if you're, for instance, if an associate for, you know, doesn't do so well, then I think, well, sorry, the other way around, if a KTP project doesn't do so well, quite often it's because the associate has maybe either struggled or has left the, 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 the project early and you have to replace them. So uh, getting that person right is one of the golden keys to a successful KTP. Yeah, I've, I would echo that entirely. The, and I, the, I know Christine Riley's in the call or was in the call that recently we went to re-advertising a role rather than taking somebody that they weren't confident about. Because as the funder tells you, if the associate's not doing the work, then you have to do it as the academics. So it's that crucial you find a good associate. Because the nominal 10% is actually written into the contract between the university, the company and the funder. So that is a real, they expect you in some companies half a day a week, is four hours a week. Some companies it's three hours a week. Some companies are flexible and some want you there down to the minute. That's not typical, but it does happen. I noticed Alexandra's got a hand up. I don't know if anybody else has. No, I think, I think uh, Alex. Thank you very much for, for the rounds of presentations. I, I really find it really helpful, and especially to get a grasp of, all, of the wider opportunities that can stem out from those projects um, to actually help us uh, do interesting things that are beneficial for uh, both parties. So that was very, very uh, appreciated. Um, the question, however, is more about the pragmatics of um, the kind of financial feasibility. Um, I was trying to read through the comments. I think Stuart said something about 33% of contribution from small uh, and medium sized enterprises towards the project. And my question is about the process of how does this look, that checking of feasible, uh, feasibility in terms of finances. And from the practical perspective, where do you start having this conversation? How, what kind of tools or tips you recommend for actually, um, you know, trying to sell to organization uh, that idea of a project? Um, well, that probably is easier to done, but how do you actually start that conversation about what do they need to present in terms of their finances uh, to have that project going? Sorry, do you want me to jump in there just while I've been watching? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, wow. Um, I do, I should have remembered that one, Christine. Christine's just reminded me that um, uh, the Roots to Work project, which actually had their first LMC recently, and the associates doing an amazing job already, um, have actually no fewer than nine academics named across the bid. Um, that is truly exceptional. And normally we would say not too many cooks, please. But in that one, you know, they, each of them brought something to the party. So they're all involved. Um, in terms of feasibility and financial affordability, that really falls to me in the first instance. So at the moment, I'm doing diligence in a company. In fact, I'm doing it on another screen here um, that involves looking at their filed accounts, their liquidity, solvency, trading history, etc. Mm -hmm. And if there's any concerns there, that doesn't mean we can't proceed. It just means we need to understand why, for example, there might be a, a significant debt on the balance sheet. It could be due to a mm -hmm. director's loan, for example. Even pre-revenue companies can be feasible on the basis we can show there's equity investment. And in fact, we're currently talking to UWS's next big spin out, which I can't say too much about, but before the end of the year, there's going to be an amazing uh, announcement about the amount of money this company's raised, a spin out from UWS. Uh, and in that instance, they're pre-revenue, but they're absolutely eligible based on the fact they've got a shed load of equity cash now, and uh, they'll easily afford that uh, KTP project. So 
that's how we go about the initial diligence. Mm -hmm. And um, as Ron's just learned, because I couldn't remember the colleague that worked with him or not, the Curious Orange, but it was, of course, Professor Bruce Wood. Uh, my, my memory comes and goes, and I forgot the second part of your question, I'm sorry. No, it was actually uh, in terms of the tips about, um, I guess what, what I'm um, uh, trying to find out whether the, the, this type of project really, I think, who could benefit as well are those uh, small organizations. Um, like Ron mentioned, uh, the, the organizations in creative sectors, they tend to be very small. Um, and especially there is sometimes a confused uh, status of, you know, are they really charitable or of not a charitable status? Are there Know what kind of a um, financial entity they, they are in a position like they're tapping into different sort of funding streams, especially in the current climate. So I'm kind of thinking, is there a way to kind of gently prepare them um, um, to prepare whatever documentations we need uh, so they also have the, the, the time to think about how they can strengthen um, uh, their position to be part of the project? Because I think those type of organizations could actually benefit the most in the current climate. Um, I, I totally concur with what you're saying, but equally, it's, it's unfortunate that um, while societal impact and, you know, in some contexts, environmental impact projects that are all very good and, and justifiable, um, the reality is KTP is a very business focused program and the mm -hmm. funders are very clear that unless you can deliver business impact that will deliver an accrued net profit of north of a million pounds over five years, and there's a metric to benchmark what you're talking about, um, yeah. it's, it's not appropriate. And in fact, I, I, Christian, you've changed your outfit today, but yesterday when I, I was on a call with you, Christian Harrison, um, with a, a, a very uh, entrepreneurial chap who, who's bought his first nursery, and he has an idea to do something different in the nursery sector and scale that up, but he's too early for KTP. They don't have the revenue there. They don't really have the management structure to benefit from a management KTP. So in that context, we said, go away for a year, prove your model in one nursery. And then when you want to scale up and you know expand the brand, then come back to us. Um, because I know that the funders wouldn't support it at this stage. They're just too small, too early. Mm -hmm. um, the best companies, my advice to you all is that if you can operate in that, um, small to medium size, and I, I, by which I mean I'll quantify it, that's sort of sub 50 headcount, but over five at the bottom, so five to 50, that type of organisation are the most reactive and, uh, and able to demonstrate that they've got some trading history and ability to afford it. Third sector stuff is possible, um, charities are possible, but they always have to have a business case behind it, so their core mm -hmm. service offering yeah. might be provision of uh, mental health care, let's say, mm -hmm. to a community. Um, but we need to demonstrate to them, how do you monetize that? And in fact, a good case in point, and I don't, yep, she's still here, Christine Riley could talk to that point because that was a discussion we had with Roots to Work to provide, uh, as the name suggests, uh, for North Lanarkshire, um, employment training and try to get people back to work. Uh, but having developed this project with them, and being able to enhance their operational efficiency and service delivery, they will be able to repurpose that and sell it to other organizations, i.e. the business model. Sorry, I'm waffling on. Can I just emphasize for everybody on this call, if you have, you know, similar to Alexandra's question, if, you, if, you, if you've got a business that you think, well, here's maybe someone who's a possible lead, please at the earliest opportunity begin the conversation and we can help you or Stuart's team and Jim and others can help you have those sort of conversations Alexander about affordability but also if anyone in the call is just interested in being involved with a KTP as a kind of entry level uh, interest then again please get in touch you know Jim especially knows and Stuart knows the pipeline that's coming on and as I say the Dean has approved anybody through chat with your line manager to be involved in a team, even if it's not your company or your primary area of academic area expertise, but you know, that 1% in your AP, it can begin to give you that experience because we're very keen to expand the team right across the school. And Stuart, your big challenge now is where do we go now that we're number one in the UK for management KTPs and number one in Scotland for KTPs overall, you know, what's next? We want more people involved. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I can. I can be very direct on that point because I'm actually doing the annual review with the deans and also the next year's budget planning exercise. And, and the strategy is very clear. 2025 strategy is number one in the UK for everything. Uh, now, that's tremendous in terms of uh, an aspirational target, but the realism of it uh, is only realistic if we resource it appropriately. So as a centre, we are growing and we're recruiting for staff to provide the professional service element to it in terms of the 100% hit rate we've secured in grant over the past two years that, that's tickling just under £5 million worth of awards in two years. Um, and over the period we've been here, or I've been here four years, it's, it's over £10 million in awards. And, you know, these are big numbers, but ultimately we need good people to deliver them. And part of my business case to the deans and, and everyone that will listen <laughs> is that we need to reinvest the surpluses we've generated in staff recruitment. Um, and my current modelling is suggesting we need between 10 and 15 additional staff across the university to deliver that aspirational growth. Yeah. Which is why I think our Dean Dominic's very keen to, to expand the, the pool of colleagues who are involved in KTPs in the way that I've described. So maybe that we've, you know, maybe even chat with you about a target for, I don't know, 50% of all BCI staff to be involved in KTPs by 2025 or something like that, um, to expand that team and that, and that, that, that base. Uh, the one thing I would leave you with, because I'm conscious I need to go to this other meeting, is that the biggest risk we're seeing and one of the most uh, unpalatable things that I come across, um, or least digestible, is um, when we recruit, or rather when we fail to recruit, we're given nine months to recruit an individual when we get the grant award, and we're seeing increasing uh, challenges in terms of getting people in. Um, these associates typically will be on salaries mid-30s, you know, they're, they're early stage career professionals. Um, we recently advertised a, a digital marketing one at 45K with a performance bonus and we got two applicants. Um, and the, the problem is in a couple of our projects, in fact, business school projects, we are running up against the nine month deadline. And if we don't recruit, we have to hand the grant back and that's a half million pound loss to the uni. So, you know, recruitment is the biggest headache that I've got at the minute. We're talking to Pod about maybe using more professional recruitment channels through LinkedIn professional recruitment um, rather than S1 jobs and jobs AC. But, then, you know, you, you frankly would be like gold dust and you would go in right to the top of my list of priority projects if you had a company partner that you brought to us and you said to me, we've also probably got a good associate lined up for this. Now, we have to be open and honest and transparent in our recruitment. But, you know, that is the biggest headache at the moment, finding associates. Um, that, that are good enough. Sorry, Katie, no, just to add to that, as, uh, another way of putting, I think what Stuart says, and this is certainly my view, your standard graduate, who would be very good on a multinational graduate apprenticeship programme or graduate traineeship programme, is not always going to be good for this because this is a bigger strategic challenge from day one. So you're looking for the best of the best possibly and ideally with some industry experience as well. The other thing just to say, because just because it's not emerged, there are 17 or 18 colleagues in the business school working on KTPs at the moment at various stages with various levels of experience. So you, they may not be talking about it. Some of the work that we're doing is pretty confidential in many cases. But the, the highlights, Stuart's got the 25 words we can highlight on all the projects that we're doing. Uh, that's public, public information. That's not anything in itself confidential, although the details can be. It's worth having a look at that to see the whole range of them and come and talk to myself, Stuart, Eileen, because we've been around this a long time, even if it's an idea, because the, one of the ones that Christine Riley's working on, Roots to Work, that only came along because one of their directors had previous experience of a KTP, and he thought that the organisation might benefit from one. So he approached me and said, what do you think? And I went, it's a bit different, but that's a good thing as long as it meets the funding criteria and benefit. It is a social enterprise, it is an unusual sector. They're being watched closely through the ESRC, who are delighted to be seeing these things. So there's benefits in being different. 
but essentially the thing came down to the experience of one of the directors who'd been around KTPs before, because up until then they'd never heard of them. So any idea you've got in your head at all, don't keep it there. Come talk to Stuart, talk to myself by all means. The good news is the funders will give us an indication very early in the process if we're wasting everybody's time or we've got a chance of funding. And that means that although the dis there might be an opportunity there, and that's great, you get the disappointment early. You don't have to sweat hundreds of hours in an application and then get told to go away, you're not getting any money. You'll get the news, feedback, positive or negative, much earlier on in the process. Okay, uh, thanks, Jim. Have we, we've got time for, I'm just conscious of keeping you longer at this time of year, but um, Boy checks question, just to finish on. Um, so Ron mentioned that he actually published a case study out of his uh, one of his KTPs, but I was wondering whether people have any experience actually writing case studies for teaching out of KTPs and then submitting them to places like, I don't know, the case center, which is basically a database of Harvard style case studies where the university that came up with the case study essentially gets paid per download of the case study. Has anyone actually tried doing that out of a KTP? Well, that, that, for, just to clarify that, the case that I've got, although I didn't submit it to the case centre um, at Cranfield, um, but it, it is used for teaching. And the, the, it's, you know, I've used it. I use it in, uh, with the master students. Uh, and in fact, we're probably going to put a case into the Dean to use it for le all level 10 students in term two. So we, we use the case, teach the students, and then they come up with recommend, strategic recommendations for the company or how they can improve their supply chain or whatever, um, and present those findings to the director. But as I say, the, the, the thing about KTPs also gives you the opportunity to, it's about dissemination of your findings. That's another thing that we haven't really explicitly stated. Uh, Innovate UK want to know how you then go about disseminating your knowledge that you've had. So in this case, we do use that case study and other MBA programs uh, around the UK have used it. Uh, and you know, I've been involved virtually doing some sessions for them, like Salford Business School, as I say this term, um, and, and, and it's there. And I think you know, three or four star journal articles are, are, are great and they're very important, but some people, you can get a direct hit, if you like, from the KTP by doing a three or 4,000 word case study or something even shorter, writing up with the directors of the company, you can write that case study up and use it fairly quickly, fairly easily in teaching. And if you've got that partnership with the company, because they're kind of UWS's best friends, they're often more than senior people from the company are often more than willing to come in and talk to the students. If they're a big enough company, they might actually get in some of their recent graduates to talk to our students as well about the company's experience. So you know, there's multiple things there, Wojciech, and it's, you know, it's a fantastic thing, uh, you know, what you're saying there, the case approach. I'm a great believer in case study applications. Hopefully that, and I don't, Jim, do you know of any, or Eileen, do you know of other examples? I think if that's Wojciech's question. We haven't written a, a case study per se on the KTPs that we've been working on for teaching, but however, we do get the companies into the class and we theme the assessments around um, using the companies as live projects as well. So for instance, in marketing strategy theory, we had a two and a half hour question and answer session with the marketing managers themed around gathering market intelligence. Um, and they were very open with providing the students information to help them deliver their assessments as well. Um, but in the future, again, it's all down to time and how much you can manage at specific times. But in the future, it will be good to try and gather that into case study information. And in the past, with um, the group one that um, Jim and I worked on as well, we've written that up as a case study for assessment purposes as well. But we, we haven't taken that any further other than utilising it within the classrooms. Um, but as I say, it does give industry engagement within your classes um, and the companies are very open to students contacting them direct as well so it even helps with when it comes to dissertation time if they're wanting to do dissertations in line with a company then they can get access to that as well so it definitely yeah. enhances the teaching. There's lots of ways of enhancing the teaching although I've not gone to case itself there was lots of examples we have brought in guest speakers or been able to 
you look at the structures of companies that from a senior management point of view and getting the student projects through that. And as Ryan Ron said, because if you're turning up every week, you're building a relationship with the company and you're building the relationship with the directors because these are all major changes for the directors. If we're not talking to them, we're wasting everybody's time because nothing's going to change. But because we've got that positive, if it is a positive relationship, and most of them are, then you've got access to directors that you wouldn't get otherwise, basically, unless you were a shareholder on the company. So you can get access sometimes to anonymized data, but data that can be held in confidence, if not, that the students simply wouldn't get otherwise. And we were actually identified at UK level a few years ago now by the QAA as the best example of a university in the UK at actually improving graduate experience and outcomes through the use of KTP and feeding into research work. And that was picked up by the QAA. There's also, and this is just coincidentally, one of the American publishers are talking to me at the moment around literally case studies being published in one of their textbooks. That's something they would pay for. Not taking it any further yet because the conversation only happened last month, but they are looking for this type of stuff. And they're followed up literally today, given what we're doing with companies. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I'm, I'm conscious that, I'm, uh, that, that we've ran over um, the time. So are we, are we okay to wrap it up here? Is there any burning last comments or anything? If I could ask very quickly, given that Ron suggested that there is this um, a great opportunity to learn about the complexity of this project as a part of the team, is there a short, shortcut apart from talking directly to our line managers about how to progress and be part of such team? Um, well, my suggestion would be uh, you, you, you want to be in there at the start of the process, Alexandra and, and everyone. So maybe have a chat with Jim, who's probably the best place to know what KTP possible projects are in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Look at those. And then uh, obviously there'll be a principal investigator, a main lead for it. Um, and Jim will be liaising with them about the application. So, you know, maybe early in the new year, have a chat with Jim about what are in, or even following this call, drop an email, find out what companies are in the pipeline. Maybe it's one of those that might be attractive to you. Um, have a chat and then, you know, we'll support you. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a given, if you like. Um, just the, the discussion with your line manager is more of a, a, a courtesy. Um, but you know, we, we encourage and we'll support everybody getting involved in these uh, right from day one. So is that clear? Yes, thank you. No All right. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Ron. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time out um, you know, to come. The next one is on the 12th of January. Uh, so it'll be Christian back doing that. But if I don't see any of you, have a great Christmas. Uh, and thank you for coming today. Yep. Thank you. Have a good Christmas too. Thanks all. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.